Hi guys, it is a spectacularly gorgeous day here in the end times in paradise here in East Bumblefuck, New Mexico on this gorgeous spring morning in February, Monday morning, February 27th, 2017, International Polar Bear Appreciation Day. And uh, I cannot think of a better way to appreciate polar bears <clears throat> then to bring you my weekly economic meltdown roundup rant where your old econoxy simply goes over to the enemy, to the mainstream media finance pages on, the, on Yahoo News to see, what have I got, I think 20 examples of how the global industrial economy is taking out polar bears and, and everything else on this planet. Good God, so with 20 stories, I better dive right in. Now, of course, this was the number one story on uh, the finance pages. The number two story on the planet in the general he headlines, <coughs> probably 30 versions of this no-shit Sherlock story about our, uh, <coughs> about our planet eater-in-chief. Donald Trump, his latest uh, vow to uh, destroy this country and this planet uh, with his announcement to uh, ramp up defense spending by a record $54 billion this year. A big, a big hunk of that, of course, is to make America's nuclear arsenal uh, the head of the pack, is that the term that he used? Um, anyway, you've probably already, already heard this story. So anyway, Donald Trump just handing out $54 billion worth of contracts to his planet-eating, warmongering, one-percenter buddies. And uh, the war machine is celebrating this morning. And of course, Donald Trump just wants to assure the American taxpayers that don't worry, there's, there's not going to be any net loss to the taxpayers because he's simply going to find $54 billion in places, I don't know, like the EPA, you know, these environmental agencies, the, the social welfare agencies, the arts, wherever, the, the usual list of suspects uh, that Donald Trump will just cut $54 billion out of them, which of course uh, means that it will be harder than ever to uh, keep any sort of reins in on Donald Trump's planet-eating buddies and those organizations. So the Planet Eaters having an absolute field day celebrating, and I'm sure the stock market is going up, up, up. All right, before I dive into the fossil fuel news, I was thinking about doing a full rant on this, and maybe I will come back to it. <clears throat> Our daily bread has hidden climate cost and, and everything else. So what this, this is a peek into the uh, global industrial agriculture uh, monster, big ag, and uh, ju just looking at a loaf of bread, uh, drawing the dots between our consumer and lifestyle choices and how consumers are taking down the planet every time we, we bite into a loaf of bread. Nearly half the environmental impact of a loaf of bread comes from the unsustainable use of fertilizers on wheat crops Researchers said Monday that today synthetic fertilizers boost yields, but they contain or generate chemicals, ammonia, nitrates, methane, and carbon dioxide, among others that drive global warming and everything else. According to this article in the journal Nature Plants, uh, <clears throat> in addition to effects on climate, on global warming, nitrate 
rich runoff from industrial scale agriculture also damages lakes, rivers, and coastal waters around the world, creating so-called dead zones. The new study highlights a double challenge in the decades ahead, how to grow enough food to feed the world's population set to increase to 11 billion from today's seven and a half billion in a way that does not poison the planet. Yes, quoting uh, the study, quote, a key part of this challenge to feed all of these extra mouths is revolving the major conflict embedded in an agri-food system whose primary purpose is to make money, not to provide sustainable global food security. And um, one more thing here. In agriculture, more than 100 million tons of chemical fertilizer is used globally every year. Uh, the understatement of the year, quote, this is a massive problem. The massive problem are the, are the 7 billion to 11 billion mouths stuffing all this bread and meat and everything else into them. Okay. We're going to move over to the Huffington Post, where the Huffington Post uh, asking the hilarious question, will fossil fuels and conventional cars be obsolete by 2030? Uh, well, I guess to the extent that Guy McPherson is right and we will be extinct by the year 2030, I guess that is what it will, that is when fossil fuels and conventional cars will become obsolete. This is when humans are extinct. So anyway, you know, this is these little greenies, uh, these little limp dick mainstream environmentalists at the, at the Huffington Post talking about how solar energy is going to save the planet uh, from fossil fuels. Good God, how, how many rants? You know, okay, just, just suspending disbelief for a minute and, and not even remarking on uh, j just the unbelievable fossil fuel investment into creating all of your fucking little solar panels and your windmills and all of this other shit. Not even talking about that. Let's really suspend belief and pretend for one second that this unadulterated horseshit question bears out, well, how many times have I said it? If uh, we get rid of fossil fuels, that means we have uh, eliminated one threat to the planet, which does nothing to, uh, to, you know, to lower the threat from all the other ones. Uh, and, and will, in fact, just give uh, these billions and billions more clueless morons, you know, license to go about doing their goddamn planet-eating business. Fossil fuels or no fossil fuels. But of course, uh, anybody with a fucking brain uh, isn't going to swallow that shit for one minute. So let's look <clears throat> now for the, the heart of this rant at the all of the evidence to support here in 2017, 13 years from 2030, let's look at the evidence here uh, showing how the world is weaning itself off of fossil fuels. Okay. Another question. Can you guess which country has the world's largest oil reserves? Hint. It's not Saudi Arabia. And a bigger hint is the shale revolution has dramatically changed the global energy landscape. Yes. Uh, 
there is a new kid in town that, thanks to advances in drilling technology, can you say fracking and it and all of its various close cousins n now has more reserves than the Saudis. That surprising newcomer is none other than the United States of America, which according to one estimate has the world's largest oil reserves. According to Rystead Energy, the U.S. holds 264 billion barrels of oil reserves. Yes. Um, another of Rystead's findings was the importance of shale in fueling America's explosive growth in our oil reserves with these sources supplying 50% and uh, which will be close to 100%. And this is how Bloomberg is weighing in on this story. Uh, I like this. With shale oil production like this, who needs Trump? There you go. The second coming of shale could be even more powerful than the first. The current boom in U.S. oil production is even stronger now than the run from July 2011 to April 2015 under Barack Obama, under the environmentalist Barack Obama. And this is with oil prices at half their previous level and before President Donald Trump has done anything to meet his pledge to, quote, lift the restrictions on American energy and allow this wealth to pour in our communities. Output growth, duh, no shit, Sherlock, could accelerate if prices rise or costs fall further. Uh, thank you. This is what, you know, it looks like uh, just under Barack Obama selling off uh, this country, our public lands, uh, to big oil. And, and just wait. You know, what can Donald Trump do to this fucking planet that Barack Obama wasn't already doing? And of course, if Hillary Clinton had been elected, she would have just followed right in the, in the path of Barack Obama. Okay, but let's just step out of the U.S. for a moment. How about, let's go over to Norway, where we see ExxonMobil gets permission to extend Norwegian offshore oil field. And this is in the North Sea. Uh, Norway saying, come on in, Exxon. We love you, brother. Stick around a few more years from Norway rolling out the red carpet to Exxon. We have Malaysia rolling out the red carpet to the Saudi oil company Aramco. As Malaysia says, Saudi Aramco will invest seven billion dollars in new oil hub. Malaysian Prime Minister Najib Razak said Monday that oil major Saudi Aramco will invest $7 billion in a mammoth oil processing hub in Malaysia, making it, meaning Saudi Arabia, the single largest investor in the Southeast Asian country. Yep, so that's what's going on in Malaysia. Let's see. Now, I don't know if this is, the, this. I guess this is just the whole, pl uh, the whole planet. Let's check in uh, with, with uh, some of the oil stocks. This is, I, I, just, I just picked one out of here. 
pioneer natural resources an off the radar potential stock winner. Yes, uh, one company that looks well positioned for a solid gain but has been overlooked by investors is Pioneer Natural Resource Company. This oil and gas exploration and production stock has actually seen estimates rise over the past month for the current fiscal year by about 57.6%. Anybody uh, wondering how to make money in the end times, go over to the finance pages and just go down the list uh, of these goddamn planet eaters. Here's this, I just pick one out. Okay. Um, let's see, what is going on in Oklahoma? This hilarious story from Reuters. Oklahoma regulator issues new directive to curb fracking quakes. Oklahoma's, Oklahoma's oil and gas regulator. Now, now there is a uh, there, there is a an oxymoron for the end times. Oklahoma's oil and gas regulator. There you go. Set on uh, on Friday issued a wider directive limiting future increases in wastewater disposal underground in another effort to address a rash of earthquakes that have occurred in Oklahoma amid the shale boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the Oklahoma oil and gas regulator getting tough. Getting tough on them frackers. Okay, from Oklahoma to Canada. I, again, I love it when they ask a question in a headline. Have the majors given up on Canada's oil sands? Well, they, they've laid, they're, they're laying low uh, until Donald Trump opens up the Keystone Pipeline, at, at which point there will be a regular orgy uh, going on up there. But things are a little slow this year. Uh, Canada's oil sands are incredibly expensive. Some of the costliest sources of oil in the world Unlike conventional oil drilling or even drilling in shale, producing from oil sands is more like open pit mining than oil drilling in many cases. This disgusting shit, often found in a sticky, viscous, semi-solid state known as bitumen requires extra steps to extract and process before it can be shipped. Um, as a result, the break-even cost for Canada's oil sands is, dream is dramatically higher than most other places in the world. But uh, anybody who thinks that is going to leave that oil in the ground. Just wait till the Keystone Pipeline opens up and uh, Canada can go right back to business as usual. Okay, let's go from big oil to big gas, from oil pipelines to gas pipelines. Let's go over there to New Jersey, the, the Pine Barrens, which are now called the Pine Lands. New Jersey OK's gas pipeline through protected, protected pine lands. Yes. New Jersey environmental regu New Jersey environmental regulators on Friday. <laughs> this 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 is environmental regulation in action uh, in New Jersey during the Trump scene. New Jersey environmental regulators on Friday approved 
a hotly con contested plan to run a natural gas pipeline through a federally protected forest preserve amid raucous protest. The 15-member New Jersey Pinelands Commission voted to approve a plan by South Jersey Gas Company <clears throat> to run the pipeline through the federally protected Pinelands Preserve where development is drastically restricted. Uh, there you go. It was the most emotionally charged jobs versus environment clash in recent New Jersey history. I love this. This is Reverend David Stump, a Catholic priest from Jersey City, weighing in, quote, talking to the environmental regulators, giving the, these fucking planet eaters permission to ram a pipeline across a federally protected wildlife preserve. <clears throat> quote, as a priest, I will pray for you when you stand before the throne of God and you are asked to give an accounting of your stewardship of this special ecological area. May God have mercy on your soul. Thank you, the Catholic priest weighing in on the Planet Eaters. Okay, from big gas to big mining. Miners regain sparkle as commodity prices rebound. <clears throat> Increased Chinese spending on housing and hopes of an infrastructure bonanza in the U.S. and India are driving a recovery in resource giants, analysts said, with major mining corporations raking in huge profits. With Beijing rediscovering its appetite for key metals and the economy showing signs of stabilizing, optimism is returning. Uh, this is UBS Commodities Analyst Daniel Morgan. Quote, most miners are going to be making very good cash and better cash than they have been making for years. Yes. And then they break it all down, uh, like iron ore, copper, oh, all the rest. Uh, good. God. Uh, and let's don't forget the November election of President Donald Trump, who has touted massive infrastructure spending, and Narendra Modi's Indian government's vow to fund the modernization of India's roads, airports, and railways also boosted sentiment. Yep, 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 right next to that story, the world's biggest miner the single biggest planet eater on planet Earth. World's biggest miner BHP post soaring half year profit. No shit, shit. All right. Mining giant BHP Billiton reported a, dream, a dramatic rebound in its half yearly profits on the back of surging coal and iron ore prices, and improved productivity. Yes, uh, the Anglo-Australian mining uh, giant announced a 40 cent interim dividend per share. Yes, in January, the company reported record Australian 
iron ore production in the last six months. Uh, quote, we are confident in the long-term outlook for our commodities, particularly oil. Uh-huh. Okay. Let's go. And, and of course, who are the biggest miners of all celebrating? Well, other than iron ore, the second biggest celebration all over the planet, especially right here in the United States of America, are the coal miners. This is for any clueless fucking moron thinking that coal mine, that king coal is dead in the United States. <clears throat> Trump administration blocks changes on coal mining royalties. The Interior Department has put on hold changes to how the federal government values huge volumes of coal extracted from public lands, primarily in the western U.S. after mining companies challenged the agency, challenged Interior and Federal Court. Um, the move by the Trump administration means current rules governing the industry will remain in place. The changes crafted under Obama were aimed at ensuring companies, coal mining companies, don't shortchange taxpayers on coal sales to Asia and other markets as coal exports, as American coal exports have surged over the past decades. Um, that f federal lawmakers and watchdog groups have long complained that U.S. taxpayers were being fucked out of hundreds of millions of of dollars because royalties on coal from our public lands were being improperly calculated. So, uh, how much coal do you think came out of our public lands? This figure does not include coal mining on private lands. This is under Barack Obama with Donald Trump having nothing to do with this. In 2016, coal companies sold 316 million tons of coal mined from our federal and Indian lands vowed at $5.4 billion. This is how uh, even under Obama, uh, King Coal uh, was being taken down. Let's go look at coal mining in Bosnia. Lake created by coal waste landslide floods Bosnian highway. Flooding from a new lake created by a landslide of mine waste shut down one of Bosnia's major highways on Saturday and raised fears of further flooding. Earlier this week, a massive landslide of mine waste from an open pit coal mine had blocked an entire river near the Bosnian town of Kakanj, creating the lake. And the lake overflowed Saturday morning following the heavy rain overnight. Uh, yep, yep, yep. What do I have? Four more. What is going on uh, with the the ranching industry 
the beef ranching mainly uh, in Wyoming in the Midwest. Gee, no shit, Sherlock. Wyoming and Midwest lawmakers target wolf protections again. Pressure is building in Congress to take gray wolves in Wyoming and the Great Lakes region off the endangered list, which would allow ranchers to kill the animals if they threaten their livestock. Yeah, been of, uh... Anyway. Dee, dee, dee. Well, there is a ray of good news, a ray of good news here in my uh, economic meltdown rant. <clears throat> J.C. Penney and Macy's are turning America's malls into ghost towns. At the rate department store chains are shuttering locations, your neighborhood shopping mall will soon look like something out of a post-apocalyptic movie. And that is just one of many reasons to avoid investing in this sex sector. So it looks like J.C. Penney uh, announced a strenuous, that became the latest chain to announce a strenuous round of store closures and in 6,000 members of its work workforce can say goodbye to those good American jobs. But we're going to ramp up this week's economic meltdown roundup rant in sub-Saharan Africa where we see South Africa rhino poaching dipped in 2016 but stays above 1,000. Poachers killed 1,000, well, officially, the official tally, which is, is bullshit, uh, is that poachers killed 1,054 South African rhinos for their horns in 2016, which was a 10% dip of a year earlier. Uh, as official struggle to quell the slaughter and anybody uh, wondering why that it dipped last year is because the low-hanging fruit, the easy to poach rhinos, have already been slaughtered. Uh, and, and so these fuckers just have to work a little bit harder. <clears throat> Black market rhino horn sells for around $30,000 per pound, more than gold or cocaine, with most demand from China and Vietnam, where it is coveted as a traditional medicine and aphrodisiac. In the, in the last eight years alone, roughly a quarter of the world population of rhinos has been killed in South Africa. Quoting uh, some rhino hugger, these criminal gangs are armed to the teeth, well-funded, and part of transnational syndicates who will stop at nothing. And we're going to wind up, uh, if, if anybody does not un understand the, all the dots in this story, I don't have time to explain it to you. I suggest I refer you over to uh, John Perkins' excellent book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman. As we see, the No Shit Sher Sherlock story from Sub-Saharan Africa World Bank pledges $60 million to help fill Gambia's empty coffers. Uh, 
the World Bank said on Saturday uh, it agreed to give Gambia $60 million in budget support after government allegations that former ruler Yahya Jame took tens of millions of dollars in public money, leaving the country heavily indebted. So uh, World Bank to the rescue with $60 million. Now take a wild guess who Gambia is heavily indebted to. It is to the World Bank. And if anybody does not know what that means for Gambia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and the planet, I do not have time to get into it now because me and the little dog, who was sick as a dog last night but seems to be getting better today, have to get out and enjoy this beautiful day in the end times while we still have a beautiful day to enjoy in the end times for this week's economic meltdown roundup rant. Bye guys. Okay, let's go.